Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Clark, president of the Michigan West Coast Chamber of Commerce, and so pleased to welcome you to a special morning today, our Advocacy and Action Program, featuring our Congressman Fred Upton. It's gonna be a great time together. Let me tell you what you can expect. We'll start out with some sponsor comments, and then we'll quickly transition to our feature today, which is our MC, Mike Hill of Colbrook Insurance, interviewing our Congressman Fred Upton. So we sure appreciate all of our Advocacy and Action mission sponsors. Thank you for your support. You saw their uh, information on our hold screen this morning. And then I'd like to call special attention, a special thank you to our lead sponsor today, which is Huntington Bank. And we're gonna be joined with some comments from Mark Wilson. Mark is community president here of Huntington Bank. So welcome, Mark. What's Huntington got on tap this spring? Well, thank you, Jane. And it would definitely be coming back together in our offices. When we all started our collective journey of working remotely, it was fun. It was kind of like having high school class when you could go outside. Uh, but as time went on, questions from our colleagues changed from when do you think we will go back to the office to when do you think we can go back to the office? While everyone on this call this morning um, has and will have their own journey, don't be surprised to find out just how much your coworkers enjoy being together at work. So thank you, Jane. Hey, thank you, Mark. We are so excited uh, and looking forward to the opportunity when we can gather with our chamber members again. And we know that time is coming. In the meantime, we certainly want everybody to stay safe, stay healthy, and we know the routine. Wash your hands, keep your distance, and get vaccinated. We all want to be together again. Well, it's time now for our discussion today. And we're going to invite Mike Hill of Colebrook Insurance to join me today. And Mike will be our facilitator of today's conversation. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thank you very much, Jane. It's great to be with all of you th this morning. And uh, I'm going against my kids' advice. They knew I was doing this this morning and they thought you all might appreciate it better if I kept my mask on, but I'm going against that. And, and uh, I'm excited to spend some time with you. Um, I'd like to invite our Congressman, Fred Upton, to join us uh, in the, uh, the Zoom room here. Fred is joining us from his home in St. Joe. Glad that you could be with us this morning, Fred, and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. And, and uh, I understand you have some opening remarks. I'm gonna turn it over to you to dive in and, and uh, share your, uh, your opening remarks with us this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a delight to be with you, even though it's on Zoom, I'd rather be there in person. You all uh, hosted just a, a good number of these uh, over the years, and it's always a, a real pleasure. And I, Appreciate your leadership, and obviously Jane recognizes one of the best chambers in the state, and they will all be getting together for that little breakfast and a little roundtable discussion on a whole bunch of things. But I'm going to keep my remarks short. I know you got a lot of questions. Uh, just a, a couple of things I'm going to tick off. First of all, uh, it is a pretty toxic time. Uh, there's no question about that uh, back in D.C. It's, it's really different as I reflect back on this last year. A lot of Zooms. I think I'm on four or five uh, today. Uh, even when we do hearings and markups, uh, often uh, we're at home now during these weeks, as I am all this week and, and next week, uh, but they've got to take account for people in different time zones, three, four hours away. So instead of having a hearing start at 9 or 9.30, they're starting at 11. Uh, they interfere with dinner. When you have a, a markup, they often go until 8, 9, even 10 o'clock at night. Uh, when, when we are in session, as we were last week, uh, a lot, of, a lot of votes, so instead of two minute votes, uh, they're 30 minute votes. So that ties up a lot of time uh, just on the house floor waiting for your turn uh, to vote. Obviously COVID is all responsible for this. Uh, we've had probably 30 or 40 members of Congress come down with COVID, two have passed away uh, because of it. Uh, for me, there's no direct flight. Uh, so I, when I go back and forth, it's uh, two flights there, four flights uh, for a round trip. I've actually driven a number of times. I've discovered that I can listen to a Bruce Springsteen concert uh, live, taped, I guess you could say, uh, and it'll take me across the whole state of Ohio, <laughs> going those 670 miles. So uh, that's why I go by myself uh, when I drive. Uh, but it's pretty toxic. Uh, uh, last year, obviously, it was pretty challenging. Uh, the relationships uh, are harder to develop with people either in your own caucus or, or the other, uh, that is for sure. And, um, you know, we have divided government. There was a special election uh, this last weekend. Uh, Democrat won to replace uh, Cedric uh, Richmond, who was 
is now a senior advisor to President Biden. So he left his seat in Louisiana. The margin in the House is three. If Pelosi, if there's a partisan vote and Pelosi loses three members and the Republicans stick together, the Republicans win. So it is very closely divided House. And of course, we know that the Senate is 50-50 is with uh, Vice President Harris casting a deciding vote uh, if, if it's a tie. Uh, I am a vice chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, we expanded our numbers uh, from the last Congress. We're 58 members, equally divided, 29 and 29. Uh, actually, it's 20, 50, uh, 28 members, so 56 members uh, in, in the House. We spent a lot of time and passed legislation on uh, police and immigration reform, uh, waiting for some Senate action, I hope, uh, on both of those. This last week, a number of us went up. Uh, we were guests of uh, President, uh, President, Governor Hogan uh, in Annapolis, uh, where we met Thursday and Friday with a handful of governors, uh, a number of US senators as well, both sides of the aisle, to begin the discussions on an infrastructure package not only what the scope should be, you, you, remember, you recall that President Biden uh, came up with about a $2 trillion, actually exceeded $2 trillion. Uh, there's been a Republican offer in the Senate, offered by uh, Shelley Capito, a uh, Republican from West Virginia. Uh, she came in at about $600 billion. So we're looking at the scope, what should be included, what should not be included in terms of what the, the president had, and also pay for us. Now, where do you find the money for this, knowing that we've spent probably four or five trillion dollars uh, since last year on a variety of different COVID packages. And there's more than a trillion that is unobligated. It's been approved, but actually hasn't been spent. Uh, the last thing that I just want to touch on is, uh, you, re you recall when I chaired the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, I led the fight for 21st century cures. Uh, this was a bill to expedite the approval of drugs and devices. Uh, it was coupled with $45 billion that was paid for. Uh, with more money for the NIH. And at the end of the day, uh, when President Obama signed it into law, 392-26 was the, the House vote. It really led the way for the approval of the vaccines that we now have for COVID. Uh, we would maybe still be months away from an approval, let alone the production of some of those vaccines, uh, not only for us, uh, but around the world in terms of that FDA approval. We're now working on it, uh, Cures 2.0. So Diana DeGette was my partner, a Democrat from Denver. Uh, it was our bill that oh, Fred, I think you got muted accidentally. All right. That, did you miss my whole time? Uh, Diana DeGette, I think, was the last thing we may have heard. Is that right? So Diana DeGette, uh, just in closing, Diana DeGette was my Democratic partner on passing 21st Century Cures. She and I met with the president uh, last month uh, to talk about a 2.0, uh, different research uh, ideas that we might have. And we're looking to introduce that uh, in the next uh, number of weeks, probably maybe the end of May now, we're working with Legislative Council, but really update that, look at a number of different things. And I think the president, will include some of that, we'll see, in a State of the Union address uh, come Wednesday. So let me let me stop there, see what questions you have, but it's it's a delight to be with you on at least what's a, a pretty sunny day down here in St. Joe. Perfect. Well, thank you for those opening remarks, Fred. Um, we had a question uh, submitted ahead of time that, that you touched on briefly, but just to take a little bit broader, uh, you mentioned it's a bit of a, a toxic environment in the more, it, it, which I guess shouldn't surprise us in Washington, but with the margins being as thin as they are, can you talk a little bit about each caucus, meaning, you know, are, is the Democrat side holding together pretty well? Is the Republican side with uh, those that support President, former President Trump and those that don't, are they holding together? Um, just on NPR this morning, they were talking about how Biden doesn't really seem to be teeing off either side too much, and some are actually pleasantly surprised from both sides on how he's been governing uh, to date. And so just can you talk a little bit about what that's looking like? Yeah, well, the first couple of months, so you'll remember when, when Biden came in and the State of the Union, or it is uh, inaugural address, he talked about the need for bipartisanship. But sadly, we saw that COVID package move without a single Republican uh, vote in either the House or the Senate. 
since then, a number of us, I've been to the White House a couple of times, uh, and we made the point to the administration that, look, there is a group that wants bipartisan cooperation. We've got a lot of issues we have to deal with. We have closely divided government. Let's turn the page, all right? We understand that the president used the, the reconciliation process uh, to get things done, so they only needed 50 votes instead of the normal 60 that's always been the case uh, because of the filibuster rule in the Senate. But let's see if we can't work on something that's bipartisan uh, on the infrastructure uh, bill. And that's, uh, I thought we had, they, they listened well. Uh, we'll see where things take us uh, in the next couple of weeks. But as I said, the, the margin is very close, uh, but also we have our own divisiveness on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, we, we had an early vote in the house on, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, MTG, uh, uh, Mary Marjorie Taylor Greene. I think I'm not going to go into her history, but she was uh, put on the education committee. Uh, There's a lot of controversy about that. Uh, the Democrats, this was uncalled for, the Democrats actually called for her removal from that committee. And Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, minority leader, but Republican leader, offered to take her off the committee if we didn't have a vote on it. Well, Democrats, I guess you could say, saw blood in water, whatever. Uh, they wanted to vote. She was formally removed from the education uh, committee. And now there's been a skirmish, really, for the last uh, number of weeks, where she uh, has called for parliamentary vote. She's not on a committee anymore, so she's on the House floor. And she's demanding uh, procedural votes on you name it. Uh, and it has added six, seven, maybe even eight hours of votes on the House floor uh, every week. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little rough and tumble. And let's just hope that this, these two weeks that were sort of a district work week, yes, we're still having committee hearings. They're all on Zoom, just like they'd be if we were in D.C. But let's hope that there's a little cooling off period in, in the next two weeks so that when we come back uh, into formal session, uh, with us there, uh, the things are getting a little bit better. Perfect. So shifting gears slightly, but somewhat maintaining that theme. Another question that was submitted ahead of time was looking for your insight on the various actions that states are taking to address uh, voting security uh, in one form or another. And so for better or worse, do you have any insight and realize it's not as much of a, a federal issue, it happens more at the state level, but do you have any thoughts on, on some of the actions that we're seeing states take recently? Well, let's face it. We need the states to make sure that these elections are, are accurate, that they're safe, that there's uh, not fraud that's there. Uh, different states have different standards that's uh, allowed under the Constitution instead of a, a federal standard. And we did have a little bit of one called HR1. And I guess if you watch uh, some of the news shows, <clears throat> particularly on the, uh, uh, you'll see that there's a continual banter on HR1 and how that should be used to supersede state elections. Uh, I voted against it. And I voted against that bill because, A, I believe in states' rights. Uh, but B, it also included a component called public financing, whereas anyone running for Congress, and when you figure, you know, there's 435 seats, uh, I think virtually every seat is challenged, so that's a Republican and a Democrat, but you've also got a lot of third party candidates, sometimes as many of, as four or five in a state, but all of them would be able to qualify for public financing, money directly out of the Treasury to the tune of billions of dollars. Uh, and I voted no. It passed narrowly in the House. Uh, I don't expect it to go in the Senate, but uh, that's that's that page. For us in Michigan, remember, it was the voters that decided to change the uh, the procedures that we all vote in terms of uh, a plebiscite or a ballot proposal back in 2018. Uh, it passed. I want to say it was something like 60-40. It allowed for no reason absentee balloting. Uh, before, of course, if you're over, I think it was over 60 or 65, you could, you could simply check that box or check a box and say you expect it to be gone from the, uh, your home community to vote uh, on election day. Was it, was, didn't require an affidavit or anything like that. Uh, but this now provides for no reason. So anyone can vote absentee. 
Uh, my wife and I voted absentee both in the August primary as well as the November election. Now, we we're both here in St. Joe, uh, but we filled out the application prior to that. They matched my signature, yes. Um, they sent me the, the ballot. And I actually returned that ballot to City Hall uh, rather than putting it in the mail. I wanted to make sure that it got there. They have a ballot. Uh, box uh, right there. It's still there. In the, it's in the cement uh, outside of the St. Joe City Hall. There's a camera on it. It's also next to the police station, so no one's going to uh, tamper with it. And I could avoid the the uh, the line that might have been going up to the second floor of the, as I voted St. Joe City Hall, uh, where I where uh, I avoided that line and voted you know a week or two uh, prior to the election. Every state's different. Uh, but we and of course in Michigan, your ballot is still required to be there by the time the polls close, 8 p.m. Uh, on November 3rd, as it turned out. But every state's different. Uh, Oregon, for years, for decades, nobody votes in person. It's all absentee, and they traditionally have a higher voting percentage than we have here in Michigan in terms of their electorate. Uh, we now have seven day, or I'm sorry, same day registration. So you can register to vote on, on election day and, and, and actually vote. That's different. That was actually involved again in that ballot initiative that passed uh, back in uh, 2018. So every state's different. We need to make sure that the results are certified. Uh, in Michigan, of course, uh, the pres President Trump lost by 154,000 votes. There was an audit after that. Uh, there was no recounts, uh, the, the vote was certified, and uh, it's over. Uh, some states were closer. You might remember in 2016, uh, Trump won our state by about 10, 11,000 votes. Uh, I know this last time in Arizona, I think the margin was 12,000 in Arizona. Uh, they're doing another recount uh, this, this next week, but all the elections uh, were certified. It's up to the states uh, to make sure that, you know, there you know, different standards, whether you're like in Oregon with, with mail-in votes or not. And uh, that's a state's right issue that I think needs to be maintained. So one more question that came in related to the, the, uh, the election, and then we'll move on on, on, pro, uh, on prospective items. But uh, can you talk a little bit about your vote? And I believe you and uh, Congressman Meyer both voted to impeach uh, President Trump or former President Trump. Can you speak a little bit to that vote? Sure. So January 6th was a bad day. <laughs> I was in the Capitol earlier that morning. Uh, I was not in the, in the chamber uh, for the counting of the, you know, on, on January 6th in the Constitution. It requires that uh, the states, uh, one by one, alphabetically, are, are certified by the vice president, uh, in a, in a, and members can challenge those. You have to have a, a republic, or you have to have a House member and a Senate member challenge those. I was not in the chamber for that uh, because of COVID. They really wanted to restrict restrict it to only about seventy members in the House chamber. So I watched it in in my office and. For those of you that have been out to Washington, you know that I have a balcony. Uh, my balcony looks down the mall uh, towards the White House. Uh, I saw the, the, the folks uh, go down for the big rally that the president had that morning, and then I saw them come back. Uh, obviously, it was all on live TV in terms of the events uh, that transpired inside the Capitol itself. Uh, I, taught, I was over there afterwards. We, we did come back uh, later that evening and vote. Uh, I talked to a number of the SWAT team folks that have been there. Uh, we actually have an officer from Benton Harbor on the Capitol Hill Police Force. and I've spent some time with him since then. I uh, spent time with a Metropolitan Police Officer, that's a DC uh, cop, who was actually uh, taken. He was inside the the, the, the Capitol, he was actually, uh, I don't want to use the word kidnap, but he was actually uh, physically taken outside where they tased him seven times, uh, beat him unconscious with a blue, fly, blue lives matter flag. And you can hear on his body cam, shoot him with his own gun. Uh, it was a really rough day. Uh, there's no question about it. And the folks, many of the folks that were there that were causing damage were trying to 
undo the actual counting by the states. The president the next day said that he did everything was in his words, totally appropriate. Uh, since then, uh, and actually uh, in the couple of days after that, uh, Kevin McCarthy, our, our minority leader, Republican leader, indicated that the president had called him, or I think Kevin actually called the president uh, from his office inside the Capitol and said, things are really getting bad. Uh, they had to evacuate uh, their offices as, as they all did, uh, frankly, in the, in the Capitol or, or hide. Uh, and uh, the president and the, as Kevin described the, the scene, the chaos that was there, uh, reported that the president said something along the lines of, I guess they care more about the election than you do, Kevin. Uh, that was not totally appropriate. Uh, and so we had a vote. Uh, I voted with uh, uh, nine other Republicans uh, to say that um, it should, should forward it to the Senate. And the Senate did uh, vote to impeach 57-43, I believe it was the vote. Uh, uh, and uh, But of course, you need a two thirds vote. Uh, and of course, the president then was no longer in office. Uh, as January 20th had come by, but uh, I felt that the president did not do everything totally appropriate to, to make sure that the election was uh, secure. And of course, there was no, no question on, on any of these states in terms of, you know, they, they validated the election results in all 50 states. And uh, Joe Biden got considerably more than 270 electoral votes uh, to be the next, our president now. Perfect. We thank you for that that insight. So we fully understand the need for um, a lot of the action that's been taken at the federal level from a stimulus standpoint to get through this pandemic. Uh, many feel that we're on our way out, um, and one of the challenges in helping small businesses get out is the inability to hire folks. And one of the impediments to doing so is some of the supports that's been put in place. Can you talk to what you see that the the, the the future looking like? Do you see more federal unemployment benefits, or do you see that there's going to come a point in time where that wraps up and, and that will that disincentive to returning back to work will, will go away? So when all of this happened, uh, really about a year ago, uh, President Trump, to his credit, signed a number of COVID packages. All of them were bipartisan. Uh, and we knew that to struggle through this, we were going to have to provide assistance uh, particularly to our small businesses, our hospital workers and others, our, our communities. And uh, I think that first package passed 417 to uh, even, I think, I think Justin Amash voted for it. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think that he, that he did. But it, as a consequence, uh, or as a sub subsequent issue, all of the, the bills we moved through uh, during the last year of President Trump's uh, presidency were overwhelmingly by, bipartisan. We provided more money for PPE, personal protection equipment. Uh, we provided assistance for small businesses, PPP, uh, Paycheck Protection Plan, which allowed uh, interest-free loans, so in essence grants, and as long as that small business could confirm that the monies that they were going to receive was going to be used for their employees' salaries, health benefits, uh, that type of thing. And we knew that the Small Business Administration could not possibly administer this new program, which we developed virtually overnight, which was why we really relied on our local lenders, our community banks, our credit unions, uh, others to actually, they, they knew their customer base. Uh, we were able to, to lift off some of the regulations. That was one of the things that I did as a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus to make sure that uh, they wouldn't you know, the bank regulators wouldn't come in a number of months later and said, how can you give a loan to a business that isn't open because the governor didn't allow anyone to come, whether it be a restaurant or anybody else. Uh, so we lifted those regulations, allowed that money to, to follow, and we actually provided a couple of tranches because the money ran out. We reinvigorated that with the additional funds uh, that came into play. Then, um, uh, we're in this last bill now uh, that President Biden signed into law. Yes, it was partisan. Uh, yes, a number of us on the Republican side went to the White House and said, you know, why don't we wait to see, his, you know, some of these unobligated funds? Uh, why are we adding more money when, in fact, there's still funds in those accounts? 
uh, I worked hard to try and get uh, 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 liability relief uh, protections, uh, particularly for small businesses that ended up falling off the table, didn't get included in the last bill that President Trump uh, signed into law. So it, it wasn't in that. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we, uh, you know, we extended the unemployment, uh, but not as much as had been last year. Remember last year, there was a $600 bonus on top of what an individual got for an uh, unemployment claim. Remember, these are run by the states. And in large, large part, that was because a state like Florida, the maximum that you can get in unemployment was $235 a week. Well, not a lot of folks who had a job probably can, can uh, pay their bills, uh, getting only $235 a week on unemployment from that job. So that's why you know, we did uh, the $600 bonus. At, at the moment, that bonus is $300. It expires in September. Uh, there were some votes to modify that in the Senate. We did not have that opportunity in the House. It was either a vote for it or against it. And again, it was very partisan in, in both bodies. That was modified a little bit in the Senate, but th those additional benefits uh, run out at Labor Day. But as I have talked to a number of our businesses, large and small, there's a help wanted sign in a lot of these uh, uh, places. Uh, and people where we want the economy to, to come back. Uh, I saw a report already this morning uh, on, I think it was the Today Show about rental car companies. And, and because they don't have the vehicles, uh, the rates are have skyrocketed, to, you know, even four or $500 a week uh, for a rental car. So a report over the weekend that, uh, you know, as, as we know, uh, auto production, there's a real demand as people have been, you know, is often sitting at home, uh, get either getting benefits or, or getting paid. Uh, there's a little, there's a big, uh, I, I think, an economic splurge, uh, uh, a growth that's going to be coming about. Uh, people are looking for for new products, whether it be homes, uh, appliances, a whole number of different things, and the the products aren't there actually uh, to to get to the market. So there's a real demand for for more people going back to work. And in many cases, in fact, that unemployment benefit is preventing, is incentivizing folks rather than to go back to their place of work to actually stay home, draw the benefits. And I'm hearing from a number of employers that are actually saying uh, that they're hearing from their employees that were there, call us back in a number of weeks, 10 weeks when that unemployment che check uh, uh, um, uh, actually expires. So, yeah, we're, we're close, I hope, to get the economy moving again. Obviously, it's important uh, that people get the vaccine if they can. Uh, we, we saw a, a real demand, but that demand is now waning, it seems, uh, across the country. And I just hope we don't have another surge uh, based on the numbers that we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks here in Michigan. Thank you for that. So we've got about seven minutes left before I need to, to hand it over to you for the last question. And so they're coming in fast and furious now. So you, there's a lot of folks really engaged in this conversation. So go for a little bit of a lightning round here, Fred. Uh, so last month, uh, the Energy and Commerce uh, Republican group unveiled a clean energy plan. And I think that's somewhat in response to the president's infrastructure bill, which goes beyond your typical roads and bridges, but a lot of green, ed green energy items as well. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you think needs to happen from a clean energy standpoint? Well, look, uh, climate change is real. Uh, there's a number of things that we can do uh, to, to limit or lower our carbon emissions. We're actually doing that. We're, I think, about the only country that's actually lowered our emissions of the last number of years. I'm proud of that. Uh, we can do more. You know, as we look at an infrastructure bill, the president had just about everything in the kitchen sink in it. Uh, from long-term health care, certainly good priorities, but a lot of things that many folks would not consider within the scope of what normally is viewed as infrastructure. I think we can do an infrastructure bill that would be focused on roads and bridges, on broadband, on improving uh, the grid, uh, making sure that it's uh, the electric grid from uh, making sure that it's resilient, whether it be weather uh, from weather, as we saw down in Texas and often in California, uh, protected from cyber attacks, 
And uh, we can do those things and actually reduce the president's proposal by quite a bit uh, because we also know that we probably need to pay for it. Perfect. I'm going to combine a, a couple things together here now. So uh, you're part of the great bipartisan Great Lakes Task Force and recently released some requests to the federal government on, on things that we can, how we can invest and help study erosion and items like that for the Great Lakes. Um, I'd like to tie that into, you know, if you can elaborate a little bit on that, uh, Sioux Locks from an infrastructure standpoint, do you think that we might actually see funding for that? But also then talk a little bit about what you and Debbie Dingle have been doing with regards to PFAS. Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, the, the you know you, re you remember that President Trump in his first couple of years of office actually eliminated, zeroed out in his budget uh, funds for the Great Lakes. Uh, the Great Lakes Caucus, bipartisan, uh, Bill Huizinga is actually the co-chair, the Republican co-chair. We led the effort, the caucus led the effort to get those monies restored. And so they were never cut. We actually saw an increase. Yes, we need that. Uh, it's called the Polak, P-O-E. We need that to be replaced uh, up at the Sioux. Uh, if, if something happened to that lock and it's 60 some years old, you would double the unemployment numbers across the country virtually overnight. So we, as a delegation, have worked on that. We've got funding uh, that's uh, en route. <laughs> so we've, they've done the study. They, 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 that's going to happen within, a, within the, the next five to eight years. As it relates to PFAS, uh, Debbie Dingle and I serve on a bipartisan PFAS task force. Of course, PFAS is a terrible chemical that's uh, been used in foam uh, for firefighting. Uh, it gets into the groundwater. Uh, it's, it's really bad. Uh, we've had a number of cases here in Michigan. Uh, Governor Snyder actually requested, it required every community to test their drinking water for this. And we identified a number of different sites. But we need EPA to be our partner. Uh, they need to tell us what the safe level of PFAS should be. And we need to make sure that there are the resources there to clean this thing up, sort of like a super fund uh, cleanup uh, for sites, uh, whether they be here in Michigan or something, someplace else. She and I introduced legislation a couple of weeks ago. I expect it to move a couple, uh, and it'll move probably through our committee, Energy and Commerce. She and I both serve on that, of course. I'm the, Former chair, her husband, uh, former, you know, he's passed away, uh, uh, was the chair before me as well. But I, I think that we can get this thing done and, and really provide that lifeline that communities are looking for uh, that are been impacted with PFAS. Perfect. So you recently voted on a, on a bill with regards to uh, changing the, the, the background check loophole with regards to gun shows. So could you speak to that and also uh, also speak to your position on the, the No More Hate Act? Yeah, a couple things. Um, on guns, I've always supported background checks. Of course, we have that here in Michigan. Uh, and I've supported more money to make sure that when someone goes uh, to purchase a firearm, that that background check is literally almost instantaneous. And I've tested it myself. I obviously don't have a record. I think all of you would know about it if I did. Uh, but I went to the, my sheriff department uh, and they did the, took my information. And of course, uh, my background uh, was clean in terms of uh, no, no convictions or anything like that. Uh, all states need to do that. And, but sadly for a number of states, uh, there was a, what we call a gun show loophole where instead of going to a licensed dealer, you could actually go to the fairgrounds or someplace else. And these things are roving around the country as you might expect and actually avoid the background check altogether. Uh, this bill, HR8, which I voted for, uh, would require the common sense background check and allowed for transfers of weapons or sales within your own family. And I think it identified maybe a dozen different family members from a stepchild, a step uncle to you know, second cousin, et cetera, provided for that family relief. But in essence, close the loophole uh, to require a background check uh, before someone could legally purchase uh, a firearm. And I, I think that's uh, responsible. Was there, what was the second question? The No Hate Act? Oh, No Hate Act. Okay, so this, this was uh, in direct regard to some of the, the attacks on Asian Americans. Uh, and we've certainly seen that uh, around the country. Uh, the Senate just amended that uh, last week. They made some amendments that passed, I think it was 97 to 1 uh, last Thursday uh, in the Senate. I expect that it'll come back in the House. 
uh, probably the first week that we're back in, in two weeks in terms of a formal vote, I'll vote for it again. Uh, it was, uh, you know, non-discrimination, you know, we, we shouldn't discriminate against any group. And uh, this would uh, label it as, as a hate crime, provide more resources uh, so that uh, we have better in integration between our local law enforcement folks uh, and federal ones to identify uh, this as, as a hate crime. So if we think back to a couple of years ago when we were together, tariffs was a big topic of conversation. And now as the economy is ramping back up, domestic steel producers haven't brought all their furnaces back online for varying reasons. And so there's a real shortage of, of raw materials still specifically. Do you see that the Biden administration may do anything to roll back some of the tariffs on, on foreign uh, produced steel? No, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I don't think they've had any questions on that, uh, not tip their, their hand. They're still getting people in line uh, in terms of appointments uh, through. Uh, yes, we have a Secretary of Commerce, uh, but some of the deputies that are there have not been confirmed yet. So really, uh, I don't know is the answer. Uh, it has, hasn't been a big focus of what we've seen so far. So here we go again, we, we do this every time as we've got way more questions than we have time with you, Fred. And so we, we have time for one last question and wanted to get you uh, kind of put your, look into your crystal ball and tell us what you see coming down uh, the pipe for the rest of the, the 2021 and, and potentially into 2022. So today is the 100th day, I believe, of the Biden administration. There's always a big push at the beginning of the new administration to get stuff done. Um, what do you think is going to happen uh, moving forward? What, what are your priorities and what do you think we, you know, if we're sitting here a year from now, what are we going to look back on that was accomplished in 2021? Well, two things. One, I hope that we could, we re really do reach the end of the tunnel on, on COVID. It has impacted all of our lives, uh, every community, uh, the economy in a major way, not only here, uh, but around the world too. So I'm hoping at the end of the year, it'll be a a sorry chapter that's then closed. Uh, we'll see. And that's why uh, the, the COVID package, uh, you know, we're going to need, I had the Pfizer vaccine, as it turned out, we know that you're going to need a third booster at some point uh, later, later in the year. Uh, the infrastructure bill is going to take a number of months to get done. Remember, this is going to be somewhere between, assuming that it gets done, somewhere between a trillion and two trillion dollars. Uh, a whole... You know, it wasn't too many years ago that the federal government didn't spend anywhere close to that. So this is a, a pretty big injection of federal funds. Our infrastructure needs it. I mean, let's let's face it, uh, roads here in Michigan, but around the country as well, there is a crying need for that. Uh, UPS and FedEx are going to stop buying fuel uh, for their fleet because they're moving to all electric. So they're going to they're going to lose that in terms of the user fees that they're putting into the, the gas uh, use taxes. Uh, every state around the country. So we have some enormous challenges. Uh, our ports, uh, broadband, of course, we've learned more than ever, telehealth, uh, all those different issues. Uh, we need to make sure that our communities are wired properly with, with broadband and high-speed internet. All those things will be part, I think, of an infrastructure bill, and we need to get started, uh, and it'll dominate much of the discussion and the debate uh, uh, probably through the summer. Fred, you have been a, just a wonderful partner and friend to the, to the West Coast Chamber. We appreciate you giving us your time. And, and at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Chamber President Jane Clark back to wrap things up. And I'm going to turn off my camera, but thanks so much again for your time this morning, Fred. Thank you, Michael, certainly for being our MC. You do a wonderful job with these events. We appreciate you so much. And a very special thanks to our Congressman Fred Upton. Fred, thank you for your leadership locally throughout the state of Michigan and certainly across the country. We appreciate you spending time with us this morning. And I do wanna encourage you to mark your calendars. Today was the first part of our spring advocacy mini series. So next week, Monday, a week from today, we're gonna to welcome our Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, 1 p.m. next Monday for a similar conversation. So I hope you will join me for that event as well. And then later in the month uh, on May 17th, we're going to have our advocacy program on hospitality and the tourism industry. So join us for an update on what's happening with tourism this summer. We're welcoming Pete Bukema from Suburban Inns and also the director of Pure Michigan, Dave Lawrence. So I know that's gonna be a terrific program. I'd love to have you join us. That's a wrap on today's program. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.